So today on the show, we have Dr. Haley Seinhauser. She's not only an expert at helping people reduce their stress, she is a chiropractor and a wellness coach. For years, she has helped people get their health back on track and make the connection between how the mind affects the physical body. She helps people power up their nervous system, break old patterns that keep them in survival mode and focus on living in the present moment. So I wanted to bring Dr. Haley on the show so that she can just school us on really what's going on between the mind-body connection. Like we hear this, we hear that your inner reality creates your external reality and all of that stuff, but really what's going on here and how is our stress affecting our external results in our life? Like that's the kind of stuff that we're gonna dive into on this episode. So Haley, welcome to the show. Thank you, I'm so happy to be here and excited to dive into all of this stuff and chat about it and just really like, make it usable for your listeners too. Yeah, we're so excited to hear that. Like break it down, like kids tell, like I like to say. So (laughs) thank you so much for being here. Tell us a little more about like, how did you get involved in this field of being a wellness coach, a chiropractor? Like what drew you there? Yeah, so I have actually been a chiropractic patient since I was a child. Like I started going when I think I was around six years old a funny story. I don't know how familiar you are with chiropractic, but a lot of people go maybe because they have pain or maybe it's just a normal thing for their family or something like that. But my dad had been going, I believe, for just normal things. And then I had a younger brother who, I hope he doesn't mind me telling this story, but he, for apparently like a couple weeks, was just constipated. Nothing was working. My parents were freaking out, taking him to the doctor. And then eventually they just tried taking him to the chiropractor. And it worked before he left the office. So <laughs> it just like just helped clear out his nervous system, whatever block was going on. And then as a family, we started going. So I never had any specific pain or issue. And that's not the reason that I started going to chiropractic sessions, but I was just always going kind of for wellness as a kid and it helped me a lot. So then once I started thinking about a career for myself, I was like, hmm, that's awesome. I love what I've kind of experienced as a patient. So I decided to look more into it for a career for myself. And that was basically, once I decided it, I never changed my mind and just got right into it after my schooling. And then through that is how I got more interested in the mind-body connection part of it. So while I was in chiropractic school, I got exposed to certain techniques that were looking at more of how stress, emotions, that inner reality is actually also affecting your physical health and your external reality and what is going on. So that was really cool. It kind of opened a lot of doors for me there. And then in practice, I saw that it was really needed. So, and that's how I decided to start doing wellness coaching as well, because I mean, so many patients needed more than just the basics. Uh, Like, Sure, maybe their headaches went away or maybe their back pain went away, but to really make long term changes in their life and lifestyle, the coaching was really, really helpful in ways to change stress patterns, in ways to shift mindsets and make it so there's something long term that's going to keep them healthy, keep them well, keep them happy and thriving. So that's kind of the winding story that got me to where I am now. That's so cool. So it started with your brother's constipation. So thank you for that. (laughs) And and, and I laugh because like, so, I mean, that's a big, I remember my sister really struggling as a kid with that. And now that I'm older, I can see where it's like, huh, what was really going on? Like, even if you think about stress, how that might be affecting your body and like just the connection between how everything is working. But I know a lot of people too, listening are not familiar with the chiropractic field in general, I think you just automatically think like, okay, you're going to help me straighten out my back. Right. And there's so much more to it than that. So what are you seeing with patients like coming to you? What do you see like are common things that they're coming to you specifically for? A little bit of everything to be honest. And it was actually really interesting because before we started recording, I was telling you how I had been practicing. And in Europe, chiropractic is less common. It's actually a field that started in America and then kind of moved into Europe and some of the other countries outside of America. So where I was working, a lot of people were going specifically for pain. So if they had low back pain, if they had neck pain, headaches, migraines, that is the bulk of what I saw. And then they would see like, oh, this symptom went away. 
And then I'm also feeling better in my digestion or my stress levels are coming down. So they would see different changes in their body. And then that is kind of why they would decide to keep coming or refer other people in their lives who were also struggling with these different issues that maybe didn't know before chiropractic could actually help with. And then now practicing in America, people come for all sorts of different reasons. I mean, I think still pain or a symptom is the biggest indicator for someone who's never been to come because that's what triggers things, right? So most Mm -hmm. people have a better awareness of, okay, my body is screaming at me for some reason. I need to do something about it. But then you also have some people who want to go from it at a prevention route as well. So maybe they know, okay, like this runs in my family or, you know, I've been like in this high stress job for a long time. I'm going to do something, make sure that I'm staying healthy. So I don't have these issues down the line. So I get some of that as well. So like, honestly, it's everything because with chiropractic for you listeners who might not be so familiar, we're looking at your spine because that is where your nervous system you have your spinal cord, it's protected within the spine, and then that is connecting up to your brain and then literally all your other nerves and tissues in your body. So if there's something going on that is making it so the communication between your brain and body is not strong, maybe the receptors just aren't being as active as they should be, then you're going to have dysfunction somewhere down the line. And sometimes that can lead to pain or a symptom of some sort. So when you're getting adjustments, you're basically just resetting the nervous system, making sure that brain-body connection is strong, and then helping your body do what it's supposed to do, right? Because we're supposed to be able to adapt. We're supposed to be able to heal. So the adjustments are just making it so you are really making sure that your body has your full capacity to do what it needs to do. And that's how it can help a lot of different things. That's a good explanation because I think I know in my own friend circle, a lot of people go specifically to the chiropractor because they feel like their chiropractor is really looking at them, taking this holistic approach to what's going on. And like, I really love and appreciate that because I think, I mean, not everybody is, I can't say this is true for every medical professional because right, everybody does their work very differently. But I think that looking, when you see pain, I can just tell already just from talking to you, you you're seeing this as like, a symptom of a greater issue. So you're really diving in and seeing like, well, what is really going on here versus just here's some meds for you. Let's move on with your life kind of thing. Right. Right. Yeah. I just have a different toolbox than other professions and stuff. So, you know, it's kind of, there's a time and a place for everything. Like I'm not anti needing medicine at some times because sometimes you do, but usually medicine is covering up a symptom or an issue. And if there's a way to actually fix the root of the problem without those external things, then that's what I would choose every time. So that's what I try and help patients with as well. So tell us about maybe a story or an example of where someone has come to you and they have pain and it's due to like a deeper thing or a systemic thing. And like, how do you, Yeah. What's the story of that, I guess. And then how did you approach that situation? Yeah, for sure. So I have one woman who came to me as a patient and the main concern was migraines and migraines can be pretty tricky, right? Because even in the scientific realm, like there's not, oh, I understand fully what causes migraines. There's so many different causes. It's not fully understood. So sometimes when people come in with migraines, it's because we need to look at food. Sometimes it's because we need to like look at the spine and the nervous system and how like that is functioning. So adjustments really help. And then sometimes they've tried everything and it doesn't help. But so for this woman, her migraines greatly reduced from the adjustments, but they were still nagging. They're looking and saying like, okay, well, you already know some foods that trigger it and you're avoiding it. So what else is going on? And that's when we actually also went into some coaching programs as well and looking at the stress side of things and changing some automatic patterns and also seeing, okay, how can we actually change what is going on in your life to make it so basically you're able to deal with stress and everything that's going on more effectively. And that greatly reduced the migraines. So she is like, it's basically not an issue anymore. So even though it's a complicated thing and the adjustments were helping and avoiding some foods were helping, it wasn't really until we looked at it from all sides Mm -hmm. um, and then even went into the internal and external reality part of it that she really saw full results. And 
that's a really cool way to see things too, is because sometimes it is one in one, one thing happened and you just need to fix that one thing. And that's going to help the results, but you really do need to look at it from all sides to make it. So you have lasting results rather than I feel good for a while, but then now I'm right back to where I started. That's a really good example with migraines. Cause that's something like a lot of people struggle with and they struggle with it for a very long time. I'm thinking of my neighbor right now who constantly has migraines and we know that stress, all these other, but you said food, things like that may be a factor. And you also mentioned automatic patterns. So that was going on. That was something that was causing the migraines for this person or something that you looked at and worked on. So what did you mean by that when you said automatic patterns? Yeah. So basically the way the brain works is, is that it's all about efficiency and every different part of the brain has a different purpose, right? So for example, in like the kind of the outer part of your brain where your cortex is, that's going to be the part that makes us human. Really. We can think logically, have executive function, can get some of our personality from there. And then more of the middle part of the brain kind of going a little bit deeper is where we store memories. It's where we store emotions, where we store like our actual physiological response to those things as well. And that is where a lot of those automatic patterns come in that I'm talking about with those responses. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing is, is that part of the brain doesn't necessarily care about thriving, right? It's not logical in that area. It's about surviving. So if something happened, maybe there was a stressful event when you were whatever age, your body responded in a certain way. Maybe you had fear, maybe you had anxiety, maybe you had anger, whatever kind of response came out of that event. And then if you were in a place where you didn't have time or tools or an understanding of how to actually fully process what had happened, your brain looks at that and is like, okay, well, that's great. I survived. That's fantastic. So let's do that again. So then it stores the response. So then anytime something else happens that your little Rolodex in your brain pulls back to that file, then you have the same or similar response. And those are those automatic patterns. Automatic patterns aren't necessarily a bad thing, right? Like, especially if it's something that is good for you or like could even help you thrive or means that uh, you can function normally without having to like think about everything all the time, that's fine. But then sometimes we just get these cumulative responses of things that are making it so we have a stressful charge to certain situations in our lives now really strong anxiety responses or anger responses or fear or stress or anything like that maybe logically doesn't make sense. Maybe logically it doesn't make sense to freak out about having to take an exam. But one time when you were really young, it went really bad. So you have anxiety before exams now, for example. So it's those things that make it so you can end up having these physiological responses, which can be an emotion, right? Because emotional responses are chemical responses, or it can be kind of result in a symptom. Maybe it ends up with you having like distress in your digestive system, a headache, muscle tension, because you're getting really tight. It can be a lot of different things. It's far reaching because it's your whole body, right? It's your whole nervous system. It's your whole physiology. Yeah, that's a good explanation of it. So I kind of think about it as We talk a lot about on this show, subconscious mind, and we talk a lot too about like how your brain is really just like, it's efficient. It's very efficient and it's here really to survive. And really just understanding that too, when you want to change a behavior that you're going to default to your programming that's already there and the efficiency and the, yeah, the current program that's running and that's why it's hard to change. And so we talk a lot about these things, but I think a lot of people don't realize the connection between like physically what is happening, like really you just said, okay, so I'm dealing with constipation and my digestive system is off. Realizing that this may be related to a pattern that you already have, or I like a program that's already running. So let's just say that maybe as a kid, I like did this, I got called to the front of the classroom for something, right? And I was supposed to speak on something and I go to the front and let's say I walk up there and I fart before I get up on the front. I don't know. (laughs) Right. And this is extremely embarrassing to me. Let's say that happened. This did not happen, but let's say it did. Uh, And like, so it imprinted this trauma kind of, okay. So if I get called out and I have to go step up and speak in front of people, my brain has decided like, oh, that's a very scary thing. And it triggered 
this anxiety over it. And let's say in my life now, like this is old school stuff, but in my life now, let's say that I have an event coming up where I need to speak or I'm teaching a class online. I find myself getting more constipated. I'm a lot more anxious, right? The brain is, it's getting triggered because something similar is coming up or it thinks it's very similar. It's the same thing. And then it's causing those responses in my body. Like that kind of stuff is what you're talking about, right? And sometimes you have to dig and figure out what is going on, really. Yep, 100%. Like that is so true. And it's also really interesting as well, because it can, the things that can create those patterns might be something really traumatic and horrible that happened. And it might be really small. Maybe looking back now, like if somebody had an embarrassing moment like that when they were 5, 10, 15 or something at school, looking back now, maybe they can laugh about it. Maybe they've processed part of it and they're like, I don't care. You know, it happened. It's okay. If that pattern is still there, if that pattern has changed in your nervous system, then you're still going to have those responses because that program is still strong. So figuring out how to kind of access that subconscious part of your nervous system, change the pattern, create a new pattern is really important. Oh, that's so good. So now this brings us to how do you do that? Because that's where it gets really, first of all, most people aren't even aware of what it is. So I know there's a lot of questions you're asking people about like what's going on in their life and you're kind of like digging and figuring that out. But once you kind of get some idea of what that old pattern is or the current pattern that's running, how do you break that? Yeah. I mean, that is something that we, I really dive into in the coaching programs. There's certain techniques that do involve working with someone. So that's kind of a really awesome way to do it. If you're able to actually like work with the wellness coach like me, or like have another person that kind of does that sort of mind body stress reduction work. And cause then that's looking at, okay, like you have this pattern and then kind of breaking back down to where is it coming from? So you can see, oh, it was this event that happened when you were 10 and then do different sort of breath work and connections to make it so you're actually changing that part of your nervous system. But then even on your own, the way that you do it is you have access to your subconscious nervous system. And the best mm-hmm. ways to get there are through things like meditation and breath work and things that can help make it so you are very intentional and you have to intentionally create different habits and different pathways because basically when you're doing this you're in your conscious mind and somehow Mm -hmm. you need to make your conscious mind dive into your subconscious so the subconscious mind is part of your autonomics right so the autonomic nervous system is that fight or flight stress response and that parasympathetic rest and digest response. So doing breath work is how you can kind of connect to that rest and digest response. And then that is a way to help change the stress pattern there as opposed to being in that fight or flight mode all the time. And then meditation is just an incredibly useful way to get into your subconscious, right? So establishing a habit that in some way is helping you do that is actually going to help change those automatic patterns as well. So it's not necessarily something that you can be like, okay, I have this one pattern that I want to change. So I'm going to meditate and change that one pattern, right? It's not, you can't be quite (laughs) so specific. You might end up changing quite a lot of things, or it might be difficult to get to exactly what you're doing. But if you are starting from that place where you know your intention and then kind of diving in, creating more awareness of your body that is going to help you access that kind of deeper patterned area of your mind. Does Ooh, that make sense? Good. Yeah. So breath work, cause you think about, let's say you're feeling anxious and you're able to use your breath to switch yourself into the parasympathetic or tap into the parasympathetic nervous system and really like relax yourself. So like, that's one thing that you can do. So, and then meditation And then in my mind, when I think of meditation, what about visualization? Is that a part of the work too? Yeah. I mean, that can be a part of meditation. I mean, the field of meditation can go in so many different directions, Mm -hmm. which is also really cool because for those of you out there who maybe feel a block with getting meditation, maybe you feel like you can't do it. There's so many different kinds. So just try different things. You can just sit silently and watch your thoughts and just try and be in tune with yourself, but you can do visualization meditation as well. For example, if you know the pattern that you want to change, if you are have that fear of public speaking now because something happened and you know that your digestion goes off and you start sweating and your tongue feels all funny or something like that, then you can have maybe a certain like a daily or a weekly meditation or something where you are visualizing yourself 
not having those symptoms, you're being very specific about like, okay, I'm about to do a talk and you see yourself feeling very at ease in your stomach and feeling like confident and seeing yourself with the changes that you want to see. So that's definitely a way that you can integrate specific changes as well because then you're you're really creating those new pathways and that's cool too because you had mentioned like the inner reality and external reality and that plays right into it right so i mean it's cool because your thoughts are also patterns right so they're just tracks in your brain and in your body that are through nervous impulses. So if you are always having a thought of like, oh, I know I have anxiety about public speaking and you're thinking about how like that is you, you know that you had this traumatic experience as a kid and like, oh yeah, I I always have digestive problems before I have to speak like, and you just keep making that true, then that's also your external reality. Now it's not as simple as one time saying, oh, I'm fine. I don't have anxiety about it anymore. I'm okay. Like, you know, it's a bit more than that. But if you do start to actually change different tracks in your mind and think, I am actually, this is something that I want and I am a strong person. I have good digestion. Like, and you can repeatedly, right? Because consistency is a very big part of this. You can create new pathways in your brain that make it so it's affecting your external reality as well. It's kind of like a chicken or the egg too. You can look at it with someone who's just very, they're having a really hard time in their life right now. So a lot of their thoughts are also really negative or it comes in the other way. You know, you never necessarily know which one comes first, but if you can start to even in a small way, shift one of those things, it helps to shift the other as well because they both play into each other in a really dynamic way. Yeah, definitely. I love to hear you explain it because especially with your medical background, because it's something that we talk a lot about on the show really like reprogramming your identity, who you want to be. It's not something that you can just be like, here's a mantra for you. And you can think it one time and it's going to work out for you. And you're going to create, you want to be a millionaire. So then now you're going to have a million bucks in your bank account when you look next. Clearly, like we all know that that's not how it works, but truly, if you think about it as I want to be this kind of person, I want to identify as this kind of person and really backing it up and thinking like, well, how does that person think? And then also in repeating that, thought, whatever you decided those thoughts are, and then which lead to those behaviors, repeating those thoughts, seeing yourself actually behaving that way. And I love that you brought in literally even in your body, seeing your body feeling relaxed, like thinking about how would my tummy feel in this situation? How would my hands feel? Like, I mean, literally, because there's a lot of new research out that shows that even all this, I talk a lot about visioning and vision boards. And a lot of my courses are designed around really getting clear on that vision for yourself. And then we backtrack it with this work by like reprogramming your mind, bringing mm-hmm. in habit transformation and stuff. But the latest research out there shows that it's really important that you're not just thinking about the goal that you want, but you're actually thinking about being that person and you're right. seeing yourself being that person. And like, I lo- yeah. I never thought about it from a body perspective though. Literally what's happening in the body, bringing that into the mind so that the mind is like, oh, this is what's supposed to happen at this time, or this is what I want to happen. I just think that's so interesting. Yeah. It's a really cool factor to add into that because even with visualization, they always talk about adding in the feeling too, like, oh, what is the feeling you have when you reach your goal or succeed or Mm -hmm. anything like that? But there's the two parts to the feeling, right? So there's the thought part, the feeling of excitement or elation or anything like that. And then you have that exact same thing in your body somewhere. So thinking about, okay, for you, where is that feeling in your body? What does that mean to you? And integrating that as well just makes it so you have more of that mind-body connection on it. So it's kind of tying everything together. Yeah. I feel like it really creates a really quality program. Like that's how I see it. Instead of just taking it to one level and thinking of, you said the thoughts are the external things. It's the really the true beingness of it in the body too, connecting them both. So as a chiropractor, I just got to ask this because a lot of us are always thinking about our posture and you always just think, okay, go to the chiropractor to fix my posture. But so I'm curious to know about how does your posture affect then what's happening in the mind? Oh, it affects it a ton. It's the same thing. It can go hand in hand because for example, with posture, you really want to look at it from a brain-based perspective when you're trying to change it. 
It's about trying to make it so you are actually changing the way that your body and your nervous system are working to hold you in a good posture. Because to have proper posture, it's more about how your nervous system is controlling everything. Muscles play a part for sure. You need to have strength in your extensors and you need to make sure that all our muscles are active and playing a role in the stabilization part of things. You need to make sure that the flexors on the other side of your body aren't just like super, super tight. But then comes question of, okay, are these muscles weak or too tight because you're not doing your fitness the way that you're supposed to? Or is it because you're stuck in a stress response? are stressed when you're anxious you get pulled into flexion so your pecs get really tight your head forward head posture that everybody is talking about tech neck or there's some names for it now but that desk posture and looking at your phone posture sure some of it comes from those things and those things that we're doing in our actual lifestyle but then also what of those things are making you more stressed, more anxious, more not in the present moment and then that is further pulling you into that bad posture and when you are in flexion, when you're in stress mode, then you start to have more of those same thoughts. You have to start having more of the stress thoughts, negative thoughts, depression thoughts, because all of those things are also brain-based as well. So when you have Mm -hmm. poor posture, you're propelling that cycle. So then to change your posture, it can actually help change your inner reality as well. So that's that's a cool thing too, right? Because some people, maybe they're more in tune with their mind. So they start working on mindset changes, actualization, those things to then change their physical presence as well. But maybe someone who's not so in tune to those things or finds that it's more difficult, then look at your posture. So then look at, okay, well, I'm going to add in extension workouts. I'm going to add in balance workouts, stabilization workouts to make it so I start improving my posture. And then through that, my internal reality will also change. And the really cool thing with that is balance, right? Because the cerebellum is actually a huge player in changing your posture. And that's that kind of like back part of your brain that helps coordinate movement. And as again, movement is thoughts as well. So it helps coordinate your thoughts and change those things. And then that's going to make it so you're shifting your posture into extension because the balance work is also going to help activate the stabilization muscles and pathways in your spine. And that's what helps make it so you can have improved posture without it having to be conscious. You have to change it in a way where it's subconsciously improving. So you don't have to think about it all the time. Because otherwise you're working and you have really great posture for about a minute and then you're super, super sloshing. And then you mm-hmm. notice it an hour later and you're like, oh crap. And then you straighten up again and then it just it is a cycle. Like that is the way it is in the beginning. But if you're focusing on those brain-based ways to change your posture as well, then you start making it so it's not something you need to be conscious about. And that helps your internal reality and it grows right back into your external reality and it creates a positive cycle as opposed to a negative one. Yeah. Oh, I love this because something I often say, because I used to teach a lot around, well, I still do on interviewing. And oftentimes Mm -hmm. people say to me, if I'm feeling like, what if I'm feeling really anxious and stressed during my interview? And it's just, I can't get myself to think differently. I'm already running that program. I can't get out of it. Then I'm like, okay, well, you know, your mind and body connected. So then what you do is you open up your body, sit taller, act like you're a confident person on a physical level. And then, then it relates. And now you're going to be releasing the hormones and thinking, you know, it's going to help you feel more confident and then vice versa. When you are in that position of crunched down, you were saying you're going to be triggering more of those feelings of where you feel insecurity, anxiousness, whatever, whatever you're often feeling that causes you to go into that kind of position. Right. So it's so cool to see those connections and just also thinking about how much of a difference it could make for someone to just doing the alignment stuff for them, because now they're going to be walking around and if feeling, truly feeling like a more confident person. And how else is this going to affect their life? Now, what other opportunities are going to come their way because of this work? So now that I'm thinking of this, I'm thinking, I'm sure you've seen in your own practice where maybe you've helped someone, let's talk about the posture work and like now they're walking around, they are more confident. Have you seen it where now they're like attracting more opportunities in their life, their whole life changing? Yeah. Yeah. And it's actually so cool because I mean, for some of my patients in the chiropractic perspective of it, I work with them only on chiropractic. Like sometimes people will need chiropractic and nutrition. Sometimes they'll need chiropractic nutrition and coaching for like the stress part of things or the whole combination of anything. Mm -hmm. Right. But sometimes even 
some patients who come in, they're like, I just want to work on my posture. Or I have some back pain. So I want to work just on that. So we're just doing chiropractic adjustment and like focusing on the spine and the nervous system. But then you still see changes elsewhere. You still see improvements in their mentality, improvement in having more opportunities, being happier in their social life or in their work life, or it's so far reaching because the body then affects the mind. And that is a huge thing, especially when someone's doing the posture program specifically to make it so they're getting those subconscious changes there. Yeah. So good. Cause I'm just thinking about when I think of people that are happy and anyone that's listening, just think about happy people walking around. You do not see happy people all like crunched down walking around. That's not how it is. And like, you can see there's so much. And if you even think from a level of, let's say as ourselves, as business owners, or maybe people in our leaders in our our work where we hire people, just on a physical level, if someone comes in and I'm interviewing them or whatever, and you're all crunched down and you look very insecure, you're not someone I want to bring on my tribe. It's a subconscious thing. If you go back to like how the brain is wired tribal mentality, like who do we want to bring on? So for people that are listening, they want to attract more opportunities and stuff in their life. You really do got to consider what's truly happening in your body and also your posture. Yeah, definitely. What are some things that we can do though, even on our own, just to kind of stand taller and like have a better posture? Like what can we do from home to do to work on that? Yeah, definitely. I mean, there's so many very specific things that with an exam, I'd be able to help people with that they can access different parts of their brains because there's actually a lot of different areas of your brain and your nervous system that affect your posture. But I have found in general, everybody needs to work on their extensor, needs to work on the stabilizers and balance. So if you are at home and you're like, okay, I want to work on my posture, your kind of start routine, if you have access to a gym or weights or anything like that, would be working on your extensors. And those are going to be the muscles that kind of straighten you out. So in your backs, it's like mm-hmm. the back muscles, it's the, even your hips, like your, it's whatever is going to straighten you out and kind of pull you in an open position. Think Da Vinci, <laughs> right? So that like drawing where the person is just like standing in an anatomical position. So those sorts of exercises are going to be good for the bigger muscles. But then what really is important, like almost more important than that, is to work on your stabilizers. So if you can get your hands on some resistance bands and do, it's hard to explain over a podcast, but there's some exercises where you can put the bands around your arms. And then even like it's a light movement, but you're just opening your arms to activate these smaller muscles kind of deep underneath your rhomboids. And then even on your head, so you look really silly, but if you put the resistance band kind of over your head and then just kind of do chin tucks backwards and you can add in different Mm -hmm. head turns and things like that to get different areas of those muscles behind your neck, those are really effective at making it so you can get more stability there. And then the biggest thing, and this is easier to explain. So if that explanation you're listening, you're, I don't know how to do those resistance bands exercises, reach out to me. I can try and explain it better. She'll have my contact information. But balance exercises is huge. If you can get on a BOSI ball, get on a wobble board, do a one leg stand and then make it more complicated. Look at a dot on the wall and add in some head turns. Do something complicated, a figure eight with a weight in your hands on one side with your arms. Move your other leg around. Just make it so it's more challenging. As long as you feel stable enough when you're doing like the initial balance exercise, you might be surprised. Some people... I've had patients come in and we are like, okay, we're going to work on your posture. Let's see how you do in a one leg stand. And they almost fall over, even though they didn't know had an issue. So you always start with baby steps. Start there. If that's difficult, start with that until it's easier. And then kind of add in a little extra thing, add in a little extra thing on top of that. But the balance work is huge in making those changes to your whole nervous system, which is then going to activate the more of the posture centers in your brain to then help you come back down and make those changes. Oh, that's so so good. Some episodes back, we talked about some exercises that Sean Stevenson from the Model Health Show had recommended. And he talked a lot about, what was it? Proprioception, the balancing and all of that. And that's, I teach a lot of like this five minute workout because I always say like starting small and starting to build that habit and starting to be the person that actually works out. Starting to program your mind in that way is so powerful. But in my little five minute workout, I work a lot on balance. And I think about yoga too, how much work you do then just working on your balance, you know, lifting one leg up and like this stuff is so helpful. Even just when you're putting on your shoes, practicing, like just without sitting down, if you can put your shoes on and there's like these small things that matter so much to 
everything else in your life that kind of bleeds into your confidence and then all the opportunities you're able to get. These little things that we can do. When you're like waiting for something to heat up in the microwave, you can work on your balance. You know, when you're waking on, yeah. waiting on your coffee to brew or all these, because sometimes I think people think it's so, you, it has to be such this big thing, but everything starts small and then it adds up and it makes you become the person that you are now. Right. Yeah, definitely figuring out how, especially if you are that person who just hasn't worked out in a really long time and just having a really hard time getting into the groove of doing something movement wise or something that's good for your posture, something that's good for you in general, then figure out who you are. Some people need to dive in. They need to be like, okay, well, I'm going to work out. I'm going to work out for at least a half an hour. And like, it's going to be that if it's less than that, that doesn't work for them. But sometimes, and I find more often, just make it usable. While you're waiting for the coffee to to brew, while you're brushing your teeth, do one minute, one leg stand on one side, one minute on the other side. Make it so very usable. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. All of those things. If there's something that you do every single day, then that is when you coordinate a new habit with it because then you have an anchor to it. So you know, okay, brushing my teeth, that's my balance time. Making my breakfast in the morning, that's when I do this other thing. So you can have that become a habit because you're pairing it with something that you're already doing every single day. Oh, that's so good. I love that you brought that up because that's where we can start doing this work is looking at the habits we already have. And this is brain-based stuff. If you want to build new habits, these are the best ways that you can do it is anchor it with something you already have. And then these small things matter so much because they make yourself proud of yourself. And like, before you know it, you will be the person that's working out an hour. Let's say right now you're like, no way, I'm not going to be doing that. But you'll start to become that person because you're like, oh, like this is very doable. I'm proud of myself. And even if you add it up throughout the day, you probably would shock yourself. If you use these little moments of time, you would shock yourself as like how much you actually got in throughout the day because every little bit counts. So another thing I want to bring up is the environment as far as creating new habits for yourself. So you kind of like alluded to this. So I'm just curious to know, I'm going back to posture because I know it matters so much with the nervous system. So like, what are some things that we can do in our environment that is going to help set us up for success? Yeah, I mean, there, you can go at it a couple different ways there. First of all, the kind of more basic explanation would be making sure that you set your environment up ergonomically. So if you've got a work from home setup or if you're working in the office or anything like that, Take 10 minutes one day and figure out how to make it ergonomic with your desk. Look at how your arms are going to be positioned. Look at where your screens are. Make sure you're not sitting twisted half the day looking at a different monitor. Those very like simple things. Another really amazing thing that you can do if you do sit for your work or sit when you're relaxing or anything like that is get a wobble cushion, like one of those circular discs that you can sit on. That's an awesome thing that you can do to make your environment more ergonomic because And I don't mean like the wedge ones. I mean, like literally just the the discs that you sit on because then that makes it so when you sit down on it, one, you have to kind of sit up a little bit straighter because otherwise you'll just kind of wobble off to the side. And two, that's going to activate your intrinsic muscles that are, again, just putting receptors up into your brain. So your posture system is being activated even when you're sitting because normally sitting, they say sitting is a new smoking, right? It's really, really bad for you. But the fact Mm -hmm. of the matter is you're going to be sitting sometimes. So if you sit, then sit on a posture cushion. And then the other thing would be is outside of like normal ergonomics, which I think for the most part, people have a decent understanding of like things that you should be doing. Like don't be looking down at your screen all day, like make it so your monitor is level. Even in your kitchen, look at how you can set things up. So you're not always having to look down or change the way that you position your feet while you're brushing your teeth or anything like that. So you're not just leaning over the sink or anything. But Also, if you're in in your environments where you're there for a while, so at your desk while you're working, or if you're watching TV or relaxing in the living room or the kitchen or dining room or wherever you spend a lot of your time, put little things here and there as posture reminders. So just something completely outside of your normal design or decor or whatever, have it be there. So anytime you notice it, you remember, oh, I'm going to do a posture check. You scan your body. You see how you're doing. Do I need to roll my shoulders back more? Have I gone into slouch mode? Should I get up and take a 30 second walk just to do a little posture break? But have those little weird things here and there just to be a posture reminder. So then you can kind of go into a different position because whether you're sitting, standing, anything, you don't want to be in that position for super long periods of time. So something to remind you, 
some people like alarms, but personally, like that drives me crazy. So I'd much rather have something that I like look up, notice, and then have that be my indicator to go change what I'm doing. Yeah, that's so good. I love it. So we'll have to put in a link to what the posture like cushion thing might look like for anyone that's wondering, because I want to get one of those. So you'll have to share that with us, Haley. Yeah. (laughs) But there's, oh, we can talk forever about this. This is so good. So I know that you are someone who obviously is very intentional. I am the same way with my little reminders of different things because I understand how the brain works and I want to trigger myself into a certain action. I'm always thinking about how I want to be and all that. So I know that you just, this is the kind of person you are. You're always working on being more intentional in some way, in some area. So I'm curious to know what area of your life are you working on being more intentional in? And then what's a tip for us that you have in that area since you've been working on it? So honestly, I'm definitely working on being more intentional in actually the way that I'm doing things in relationships. So ways that I'm wording things, if I'm saying something, sure that I'm following up with it. And that is really just a matter of slowing down a little bit, being more present with where I am so that when I am speaking, I know that it is aligned with what I believe in and Mm -hmm. how it works with the people that I'm involved in, whether it's friendships or family or anything like that. So, and that takes, it's the same mind body connection, right? So whether it's doing something with physical fitness or your nutrition or anything like that, slowing down and being present is the most important thing. So then you can know that you are being very intentional with your action. And in what I'm working on right now, it's going to be my word that I'm saying. So that is, I think very much I mean, that crosses the boundaries with anything, in my opinion. Yeah. And you are someone that is really focused on being present and in the moment. And that's something a lot of us struggle with. So I'm just curious, what's a quick tip for us to be more present, truly? It's habit, right? So you have to figure out for you how you can check in with yourself on a regular basis with how present you're being. So even if it starts out with being like, okay, at the beginning of the day and the end of the day, I'm just going to do a check-in and see how I did. So in the beginning of the day, maybe it would be a, it can be quick, right? It can be just a couple minute routine of, all right, I'm going to do some breathing, maybe a little bit of visualization and meditation to set myself up for being in the moment and being present throughout the day. And then at the end of the day, I like to recommend kind of like a reflection. So you look back and you try and see maybe some areas where you're like, oh, you know, maybe I wasn't as present as I could have been. Like, what can I do differently next time I'm in this position? So it's not like you're focusing on the negatives really, but you're looking at and seeing like, oh, this was an obstacle that Mm -hmm. I want to deal with differently next time it comes up. So then create that plan for when it comes up again. And then also you want to look back and see, okay, well, what were my little wins? This was actually something you had said earlier about I don't remember exactly what it was, but you were talking about like being proud of yourself and being proud of like, okay, well, maybe I'm only working out for five minutes now, but that's going to lead into working an hour later. But so you really want to celebrate those little wins. So you want to look back and see like, that that's really awesome. So when, when I was at lunch and this person came up to me at the office, we were, and we were speaking, like I was so present or I did this so well. So even if it's a very small thing, really noticing that, integrating how that felt And that's going to help make it so you continue that action that you did well, more consistently in greater things and like bigger things. So you want to celebrate all those tiny little wins as well throughout the day. Okay. So having those kind of bookends is awesome. I'm over here wanting to clap and I'm going to hit the mic over here. But like, it's so good because it's, you said integrating how you felt. And we talk a lot about this on the show really reviewing and seeing how things are going and also like celebrating your wins. But we don't talk a lot. I mean, well, we always are talking about the brain, but really seeing that what we're doing here is we are reprogramming. And like you right. were saying that integrating, like, how did that feel to do that? Oh, it felt really good. And the mind's, oh yeah, the subconscious, I like that feeling good. I like making myself proud. I'm going to do more of that. Like next time we're in that situation, that's who I'm going to be. It sounds so weird when I'm saying it, yeah, but li- literally this is us really being intentional with our minds and reprogramming our light or minds to fit in with the life that we want. That's really what it's all about. Yeah. That's awesome. I love it. Well, it's so good. Thank you so much for being on the show. Is there anything else that you want people to know? Where can we find you? All of that stuff. Yeah, definitely. So I am on Facebook. I have my website, healthyhabitstudio.com. I'll send you all the links and yeah, I would offer listeners a free session with me as well for my coaching, we can dive into finding what are your automatic patterns? How can you start changing that so you can be living more intentional and be more present? 
So I'll send you my details and feel free to reach out to me. Honestly, if you had any questions about what we talked about too, whether it was related to the posture exercises or those mind body patterns or anything like that, I'll, I'd love to kind of clarify any questions that you guys have for me. Oh, yes. Okay. So you better take advantage of that if you're listening. I will have all of the details in the show notes so you can connect with Haley. But wouldn't it be so awesome to have someone in your life like that? Like, I think so many of our listeners are always looking for people that are really considering them as an individual, taking a personalized approach, thinking of yourself, thinking how your whole body is functioning and your entire life. That's the kind of care that you want. So you will have all of Haley's information. Right now, she is working in Phoenix, Arizona, but that doesn't mean that you can't do something virtually with her and benefit from it. So again, you'll have all these details. Thanks again for being on the show. Thanks so much for having me, Angela. This was a blast.